Greetings comrades! So recently we shot out a community poll with a few content options to find out what topics appear interesting to you guys. The result was decisive, hence why we are now working on a Soviet historical loadout. But since we don't want to keep you waiting too long, while we work on this we have every opportunity to take a look at a piece of Soviet Siberian gear. More specifically, the RSH4 gas mask. I'm Aramid, and without further ado, welcome to the video! To avoid confusion, I should probably point out that it actually has two names. The common military designation for it is RSH-4. It roughly stands for Unrolled or Expanded Cartridge Model 4, which has to do with filter layout. However, the more correct designation, according to its own manufacturing papers and manual, is EO-16, also referring to the filter. What we're looking at was one of the most widespread gas masks in the Soviet Armed Forces. RSH-4 entered production in the late 1950s, to replace gas masks with older filter designs. It remained in service until the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, and probably later existed in some amounts in post-Soviet militaries. The RSH-4 gas mask is a somewhat modular piece of gear. It could be equipped with several different face pieces, additional filtering cartridges, cold weather outserts, and even different bags depending on the conditions and what kind of equipment or optical devices were to be operated while stirring. It was designed to offer general protection from common threats related to the use of weapons of mass destruction, such as radioactive particles, biological or chemical combat agents. Specific protection was to be achieved with above-mentioned additional cartridges. This is by far the most sophisticated Soviet gas mask out of those equipped with a large dimension filter. It turned out so successful that pretty much all armed services adopted it alongside the military, and license copies were produced in many countries of the Warsaw Pact. Now to the gas mask itself. We are very lucky to have a specimen in such a good condition. It is practically factory new, with most of its individual packaging intact. But unfortunately, we got it with no papers to use as a primary source for our review, as those only come one per crate. But don't worry, comrades. A session of digging through the Russian internet segment revealed nothing short of the original instruction manual for this exact gas mask, in which it is, by the way, designated as EO-16. According to the manual, the basic RSH-4 kit, like we have here, includes a filtering absorbing box, a face piece, a connector tube, a carry bag, and anti-fog. In wintertime, the kit is additionally equipped with outserts for the goggles on the valve unit. Although the manual is in Russian, there are quite a few useful illustrations and instructional charts. I made sure to drop it on our Boosty and Patreon pages, so that those of you who need it can easily find it. It is absolutely free, but if you like our content and want to support the channel, you can also do it there. The links are down below. Looking at this face piece, you may say, hey, Aramid, but this is a GP5 mask. But trust me, it's not. Neither is it an identical military copy named something different. It is actually a SHM-41M helmet mask. When compared to the SHM-62 helmet mask used in the GP5, they do appear very similar. But the valve box here is significantly more projected, while the thread is oriented at an angle. I assume it is constructed this way to aid in the installation of a winter outsert. Apart from these differences, the masks are close to identical. The valve box has a similar overall construction, the goggles are of the same round design, with a slot for anti-fog, and the internal ventilation is the same, while the rubber portion itself seems to have been manufactured with an identical press form. The only other inconsistencies between the two are the markings. On the right side of the face piece, there is a stamp with a factory marking and the year of production first quarter of 1964 in this case, as well as a press form number below it. On both sides there are the usual size stamps. This is size 2 of the total 4. Interestingly, the factory markings are doubled on the inside with ink. This appears to be a common trait on many masks intended for the armed forces. Other variants of the RSH-4 could be equipped with such face pieces as the SHMS helmet mask, the MM-1 mask, or the SHR-2 face piece for head injuries. Since the RSH-2 is equipped with a large vertical filter, a corrugated connector tube is included in the kit in order to connect it to the face piece. It is essentially a rubber hose with a textile protective cover. It has male and female sections of the Soviet 40mm thread on the respective ends. The more curious part here is the filter, and I can already anticipate the avalanche of comments warning me about asbestos. But don't bother comrades, I'm well aware. Suka, I'll make a video on the topic sometime soon. As previously said, the RSH-4 is the most sophisticated Soviet gas mask with a large dimension filter, and it is so because of the filter. In older designs, the filtering elements inside the cartridge were located horizontally 
and in a vertical sequence, which heavily reduced breathability. But here, things are different. This is an EO16 filtering absorbing box that the gas mask is based around. EO stands for single or rather universal sample number 16. This naming system is consistent among military filtering canisters. The innovative nature of this filter is in the vertical and cylindrical organization of the filtering elements. The outer layer is anti-aerosol fabric preceded by an anti-dust section. The middle layer is of course the active carbon, the main absorbing element. It is enclosed by yet another layer of fabric. The innermost cylinder, as you can see, is empty. Such a layout offers a larger surface area for air to travel through, allowing for improved breathability. It is optimal in large dimension filters. On the outside, the FPK is enclosed in a metal canister with structural protrusions, marked with its designation, day, month and year of production, serial number as well as batch number. The top holds a Soviet standard 40mm thread covered by cap and gasket. The bottom is more interesting here. Apart from your usual rubber plug, there is an extra thread. The use of additional thread-specific cartridges is intended for this filter, like this anti-chlorine canister, for example. The thread is noticeably shallow, though it is enough to make a seal. I also assume that common additional cartridges have a respectively short thread. The gas mask comes in a bag made with more robust fabric in comparison to softer and simpler civilian bags. Many structural elements are also double-stitched. There is an adjustable shoulder strap and a waist strap, also adjustable. Unlike civilian bags, it has a metal clip instead of a tying loop. It has a subdivided main compartment and a side pocket closed with a single metal button. The flap of the main compartment, however, is instead closed with a buckle lock, the belt of which is linoleum. On the underside, there is a factory marking with the date of manufacture and a quality control stamp. The bag is compartmentalized into three main sections. When the gas mask is disassembled, the first one is to hold the face piece, the one along the front is for the connector tube, and the final one is for the filter. When the gas mask is assembled, only the larger two are in use. Because the filter remains in the bag while the gas mask is worn, the filter compartment is equipped with a retention strap that would prevent the canister from popping out in motion. There is also a pair of wooden blocks fixed in place in the bottom. Those are meant to further improve breathability by preventing the fabric of the bag from clogging the filter intake. Lastly, there is a small pocket sewn in between the two compartments. It is meant to hold the anti-fog. In case of RSH4 variations with face pieces that are equipped with a voice membrane, the separate membranes would also be in this pocket. The pocket on the outside is designed to primarily hold a personal anti-chemical agent, such as an IPP51 or an IPP8. It's worth mentioning that this kind of bag was used in kits for enlisted personnel. Officers had a different variation. In order to prevent the fogging of the goggles, Soviet gas masks are equipped with anti-fog agents. Older gas masks would usually come with a KPZO soap crayon that would be manually applied from the inside. Later kits would come with a set of anti-fogging fill that is installed into the goggles from the inside and replaced with spares as needed. To prevent external fogging as well as to prevent icing of the valve unit during winter time, the RSH4 could additionally be equipped with protective outserts, but unfortunately in our case they were not included. When it comes to storing and using the RSH4, a common rule set applicable to most Soviet filtering gas masks is to be followed. It is generally described in the manual. In order to store the gas mask, all elements should be inspected for damage and placed in their respective compartments. Before use, the gas mask should once again be thoroughly inspected, assembled accordingly and treated with anti-fog if needed. According to Soviet CBRN drill, there are three wearing positions. Stowed, ready and combat position. In the stowed position, the gas mask is assembled inside the bag with the flap closed. The bag is worn on the left side at waist belt height, slightly back is not to interfere with movement. In the ready position, the flap is open, the gas mask is ready for use and the bag is moved forward and usually fixed with the waist strap. In the combat position, the face piece is of course worn by the user while the filter remains in the bag. The RSH-4 was very abundant in the Soviet Armed Forces and other institutions, 
we will likely use it in our future loadouts and impressions. What we're trying to achieve by making content like this is a collection of detailed videos on widespread Soviet and post-Soviet gear and equipment. We will organize these videos into a set of playlists so that people from all over the world can access this knowledge for reenactment, airsoft cosplay, or purely from a historic point of view. So, wherever or whenever you're watching this video from, comrade, I hope that it was informative and that you enjoyed it. Bye-bye!